I, I'm David Collins. I'm on the committee of the, the uh, Movement for the Abolition of War. And thank you so much for that comprehensive and totally impressive talk, which will bear a lot of analysis later. So my question is, Keir Starmer's leadership manifesto included a Prevention of Military Intervention Act. Will this be adopted as labor policy? And if so, would it establish an independent non-political body to rule on the legality of wars and arms sales? I'll now move to the next question. And from Robin Brooks. It occurs, well, it occurs to me all the time that we need to build a culture of peace through the UK. I mean, the reason why I say that is because people are frightened when you start talking about peace and disarmament. They think they're not going to be defended. So I think education is really important. And I think it's really important right at the root. So I'm just asking Fabian, will his role include promoting peace and conflict resolution in schools? And probably in other ways as well. Thank you. Now from Linda Walker, can we have your question? Mm. Hello, Fabian. Um, I'd like to know how we're going to change Labour Party policy on nuclear weapons. Have you got a plan and what can we all do to help to make that change happen? Right, that's the three Thank questions, Fabian. Thank you very much. Right. Um, so, David, uh, let me uh, come to you first. Prevention. Prevention of Military Intervention Act. I, I think uh, Keir is determined, actually, to ensure that um, we do have such an act. Now, obviously, it depends uh, how we form the next government with an outright majority or in coalition with other progressive parties. That remains to be seen. And I won't get into the debate about whether we should have proportional representation or not. Uh, but clearly, that would be a much fairer system. Um, the the will the Labour Party adopt this policy? Yes, I think it I think it will. I can't see why it wouldn't. And will there be an independent non-political body to rule on the legality uh, of wars and arms sales? Well, I think I've covered the issue of arms sales, actually, uh, in my remarks about the CAKE, the Committee on Arms Export Control, because if we implement what I am suggesting and what I have to say, David, has been supported warmly by both the Conservative Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee the Conservative Chair of the Defence Select Committee and even the Conservative Chair of the uh, CAKE Committee at the moment and the SNP Chair of the Trade, the International Trade Committee, all of them are in strong agreement that the Committee on Arms Export Control should be a full select committee. And from there, it, the next step is to actually having a, an assumption against an arms sale license being granted rather than in favour of it. And then the person arguing, the a witness arguing for those arms sales, have to make the case to the committee. And it has to be a positive decision rather than, oh, uh, we're going to try and stop that. So I think that, that deals with that. Now on the, uh, and it wouldn't be independent because that, but that would be a non-political body because select committees are, are by a cross party, as you know, and they tend to work actually rather well cross party. I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee for 10 years and the splits on that committee, I was there during the uh, invasion of Iraq were not down party lines, uh, oddly enough. There were Labour MPs like myself who strongly opposed the war with Iraq. There were some who were in favour of it and supported Tony Blair's arguments. There were Conservatives likewise uh, and Lib Dems likewise. So um, I think select committees are, are, are quite a good non-partisan political body. But I think your question is, will there be an independent body? I don't know. And I don't know that the details yet have been worked out, David. Uh, it's certainly something I would want to suggest to Keir. And what really struck me when he called me to ask me to carry on with this work was that he, he mentioned that the previous work I was doing in addition to peace and disarmament under the Corbyn administration was Middle East and North Africa, and I was on the defense team. And what he said to me was, I want you to concentrate on peace building, uh, conflict prevention uh, and uh, uh, arms control specifically. So I'm going to give a Middle East North Africa to somebody else so that you can devote your energies to this particular uh, important crucial part of policy. And Lisa Nandi has since said that it will be right up there as one of the most important areas of work for a new government on international policy. So I think the answer, the short answer to your question, David, is I don't think the details have been worked out yet, but what you suggest is a very good idea and I'll make sure that's fed in. Uh, Robin, thank you for your question on 
education being at the root of uh, uh, the root of um, our change in attitude towards conflict and war. And of course, you're absolutely right. Now, the problem with our governmental system at the moment is that we're all compartmentalized into silos. Uh, I'm in foreign in the foreign office team. I was in the defense team before, but I'm not anymore. So I can't have any say in defense policy. And <coughs> likewise, um, if I was to be the real minister for peace and disarmament, would I be able to go into schools? Well, I would have no formal role, but I would hope that a future Labour government would realise the importance of changing the culture in our society, actually changing the way, the, 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 the normative values that we have about what is acceptable and what isn't. And this isn't about brainwashing. This isn't about... Um, trying to uh, interfere uh, with children's education. It's about making our society, like many Scandinavian countries actually, uh, a country where people assume that peace should be the norm, that the military industrial complex shouldn't rule everything, that we shouldn't all be slaves to that complex uh, as they have in, in, in the United States. So I think that's a very good idea. I would hope um, that a future Labour government uh, will want the role of the, sh the Minister for Peace and Disarmament to be one of education as well as actually implementing those treaties that I've described in such, I hope, not too boring detail. So I hope that answers your, your question. Linda, um, how do we change party policy? Gosh, you know, I've been a member of CND since I was a student and that was an awful long time ago. Um, and most of my friends in the Parliamentary Party know where I, where I stand. In fact, some are deeply critical of my long-term hatred and disdain for nuclear weapons uh, and my support in uh, under Neil Kinnock's leadership for unilateral disarmament, nuclear disarmament. We, I think, were badly burnt electorally and I don't think it was because of that policy, but a lot of people, mythology says it was. Your question was how do party members change party policy? And I just say, well, we're a democratic party. And although coronavirus has muted our ability to influence our party leadership uh, through not having conference and not having some of the meetings we normally have, we still have online branch meetings and constituency meetings. And I would encourage all Labour Party members who are listening to this and who know others who are not here today to move resolutions at your constituency Labour Party, to move conference resolutions, to put pressure on the NEC, the National Executive Committee of the party uh, when it's elected and the leadership to say, we want to change our policy about our ownership of nuclear weapons, especially given the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that's coming into force next January. This is a really important moment in the history of the human race, I believe. And uh, I, I would never overestimate the, how important it is Let's use it as a way of saying to our party leadership that we should join the TPNW as quickly as we can and phase out our nuclear weapons. Now, unfortunately, uh, I've been told off before for uh, straying away from party policy. Party policy is currently to accept that we have a nuclear arsenal of our own independent, so-called independent deterrent. I think I've made clear what my own personal views are on this. So I would encourage all grassroots members to do what they can to put pressure on the party's leadership, on the people in the different teams, defense, foreign office, the leadership, to actually change our policy, phase out those weapons, whether it's multilateral or unilateral. Let's get rid of our nuclear weapons. We have no business owning them in the first place. Let's do our best to get rid of them. I can't be more clear than that, I hope, Linda. Thank you. There is one rather similar one from Nigel Day of Oxford CND which is, is privately on there, so you may not see it. Nigel, could you say it? And also, if you have something slightly different to ask in the last question, it would be useful. Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, Nigel here. Yes, I, it's not privately. I think that somehow got mixed up with mine. But yes, I want you to, you to comment on the UK government's intention to spend uh, $205 billion on replacement of the Trident system with new nuclear weapon system. Now the TPNW is coming into force. I think you've answered a lot of that already, but uh, how are we going to influence that if we're not, not just in the Labour Party, but all of us? And the second question is from Agnes Siegel uh, from East Finchley in London. Could you ask your question, please? <clears throat> Do you agree that it will be impossible for the UK to become a respected power for peace 
as long as we remain faithful and uncritical allies of the U.S. Okay. And then, um, are you ready for another one? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'm just writing this down. Yeah, carry on. This one, uh, can Susan Bewley please read out her question? Well, thank you very much, Fabian, for your integrity and commitment. And I love the message of start at home first. Can I ask, because politics is about compromise, how far back you think you will manage to examine Labour's links with arms sales, lobbyists, and previous ministers and prime ministers who may or may not face justice regarding engaging in illegal wars in the past? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I know what you're getting at there. Uh, right. Okay, David, shall I, shall I tackle those three? Yes, then? please. Thank you. Yeah. So, Nigel, um, I mean, I think you, there's two important points you make, which I haven't really touched on. One is Trident replacement. Um, I remember so clearly uh, the day in March 2007 when I was summoned to the Chief Whip's office and told that I, if I didn't vote for the replacement of Trident, this was under a Labour government, the Chief Whip was... Um, the home, who, Jackie Smith, who became Home Secretary subsequently, um, that if I didn't vote for the replacement, uh, that there would be serious consequences for, for me personally and for, I mean, it was basically, she was trying to threaten me, but not very effectively. I didn't vote for it. I never have voted. Um, unfortunately, I'm in a minority. Um, Lisa Nandy, I'm glad to say, was in the lobby for the last vote in 2016. Um, when, the, when Theresa May was Prime Minister, she voted against the renewal of Trident. Uh, it is going to be probably 205 billion plus, we're told, uh, and I think that's a fair estimate. Back in 2007, uh, January 2007, I was sent to Faz Lane uh, by the Whip's office uh, with the view to persuading me that um, these submarines and these weapon systems were a jolly good thing. And once I saw them for myself, I'd be persuaded. Well, I have to say, Nigel, that it was far from it because what it taught me was uh, a lot more about how the weapons worked. So I had far, far better information in, with which to undermine the argument that they were using to promote the fact that we should have this so-called independent nuclear deterrent. It's not independent and we know it's not a deterrent. Uh, it is nuclear, of course, but most of the technologies we know is provided by the United States, which obviously will le lead me in a minute to Susan's uh, question. Um, how, can, how can we influence uh, the Labour Party or not just the Labour Party? Look, I always say this to people and it's in normal times when we don't have uh, lockdowns and a pandemic, it's easier to do, but it's still possible uh, in the current circumstances. MPs are susceptible to pressure from their constituents, from the people that they're privileged to represent. And no MP should ever forget the privilege that is given to him or her by being elected to the Palace of Westminster, to the House of Commons. And I've been there 23 years, I've won seven elections, but I never forget who sent me there and why they sent me there. And it's important that we are reminded daily of that. So in normal times, going to MPs advice surgeries when they hold them, and most MPs hold personal face-to-face, one-to-one advice sessions, going to public meetings, lobbying through, not, I don't mean mass emails where you click a button, because frankly, they are more of a pain than anything else. We do reply to them, but some MPs don't. But handwritten, typewritten letters, word process letters, personal emails, phone calls, lobbies in Parliament, going to London to see your MP if you're near enough, if it's not too difficult, going to the MP's surgeries, ringing up the MP, you know, lobbying, using every method you can to speak to your local MP and say, this is what I feel, this is what my neighbour feels, this is what my family, my children, my grandchildren feel, they'll get the message. And the more pressure we can put on MPs of all parties, the better it'll be and the more likely we are to be able to influence them. I'm not saying that's the panacea, but it, it does help. Agnes, um, is it possible for the United Kingdom to become a major peacemaking power uh, while ever it's united, uh, sorry, allied to the United States and an ally of the US? Well, we've seen what it's like with uh, President Trump, but we're pretty certain he's on his way out now. Um, I don't think President Biden, when he takes office, will be anything like a sort of socialist uh, peacemaker. 
but I think it will be a welcome and refreshing change. And I've already had discussions with the Washington Center for Arms Control uh, just on Thursday, I think it was of last week, two days ago. Um, and I was really encouraged by the fact that Biden is determined to reduce nuclear weapons, to reduce arms sales, to have serious arms control on all those treaties I've mentioned. In fact, what this woman told me um, was that it's very likely that the US would ratify, especially if they had control of Congress, would ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Now, you may think that that's not a great um, step forward, but once the US ratifies the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, so will China. And once China and the US have ratified it, then India, Pakistan, and other countries will follow suit. And once they follow suit, it will become an article of international law. And it will be one further notch on the ratchet towards arms control and eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. So I do believe it's important. Can we, remain, can we be a major peacemaking power, peace building power while we remain an ally? Depends who's in office in our country and who's in office in the United States. We are democracies. Uh, as long as those democracies remain as democracies and are not manipulated, then I believe that the people of this country can have a major say. Um, and so the answer, the short answer is yes, I believe we can. Susan, um, links with arm, historic links with arms sales. Well, look, from 2001 to 2010, and then again from 2013 to 2016, I sat on the cake on the Committee on, on, on Arms Export Control, first as a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and then as a member of the International Development Committee. Um, we, we heard evidence from a lot of the arms supply companies and the arms manufacturers, as well as, of course, Safer World and uh, Amnesty and many of the uh, organizations and NGOs that are opposed to arms proliferation. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's often important for catharsis to, or cathartic reasons to examine what's happened in the past and make amends for that. But is it important to devote too much energy? I don't think so. If you've got limited and uh, limited resources and limited political capital, I'd rather see it being used for future policy development and work towards uh, arms reduction, arms control and arms elimination than for the historic reasons why uh, we're in the position we're in. I know what you're getting at. The Chilcot inquiry was was pretty unambiguous in many ways, although it had a few ambiguities to it. And I was asked to respond to an SNP resolution uh, motion to the House on Chilcot. And that was one of the most difficult speeches I ever had to make because I voted against the Iraq war, uh, as did Alex Salmond, who proposed the motion. So it was quite hard actually to argue with him in many ways. Uh, but I but I did. Um, I, I'm not sure that, you know, historic examination is important to make sure we don't re repeat the mistakes of the past. But should we spend too much time and effort on it? Should we prosecute previous leaders? I, I don't, personally, I don't think so. Uh, let history condemn them um, rather than our courts, because we're going to spend a lot of time, energy and division in doing that. Let's, let's look forward to the future and see what we can do to make the world a better place, not re-examine the past over and over again. That's my own personal view. It's not a party view, but uh, that's my answer to you anyway. Thank you very much. As, as, as we go on, and there are 39 new messages. <laughs> on this. So you've stimulated a huge amount of interest. So short, shorter answers, I think, David. Is no, 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 I'm not saying that. <laughs> but uh, uh, Sally Reynolds, can you uh, put your question, please? Uh, yes, I, I think you've partially answered it already. <laughs> um, my question was about the TPNW. When it comes into force, how will this affect labour defence policy? And can you see a possibility that the next Labour government will sign the treaty? Okay, and the next one is um, Graham Davy. Could you state your question, please? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm concerned about the increasing proliferation of armed drones um, and manned aerial vehicles and in particular their use by the RAF for extrajudicial executions which are continuing in Syria and elsewhere and seem to be unregulated either by uh, international or national laws. My particular question is whether 
uh, Fabian, you see the this increased proliferation of armed drones as a serious danger to future world peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more. Uh, Colin Archer, do you want to ask a question? I noticed you have a comment. Is that a question for you? Uh, yes, yes, I, I do. I do have a question. Um, do you agree that there is a case for reducing the military budget as a whole in favour of social, health and environmental priorities? This is a question really on behalf of the Global Campaign on Military Spending, which is a UK branch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you for your question. Look, my own view, and I think I've made that clear, is that I'd want to, to sign up to the TPNW immediately. Um, but how will it affect uh, Labour's defence policy? Um, sadly, I'm no longer in the defence team. Um, John Healy, who's our sh current Shadow Defence Secretary, is um, a very old friend of mine and a fellow Yorkshire MP. We've been MPs together since 1997. He's one of the most competent, thoughtful, um, and I'd like to say radical people that I know. I think that if there's a way to do it, John will find that way. Um, the problem for, the, for us and the TPNW is firstly, the British government boycotted it completely. When I arrived in New York for that first session, I was horrified to see uh, our ambassador, Sir Matthew Rycroft, together with uh, Nikki Haley, the US ambassador to the UN at the time, and the French standing outside the iconic United Nations building on 42nd Street and First Avenue, uh, denouncing this discussion and this potential treaty uh, because how dare the UN tell us, the nuclear armed nations, that we can no longer have nuclear weapons? Don't they understand the threat to world peace that that would pose, never mind the non-proliferation treaty, which would be undermined by it? Um, both of which are total nonsense, of course. That was then, four years on almost to January 2021, we're going to see the treaty come into force. I think that changes things considerably. Um, I hope that would affect defence uh, thinking and defence policy on our side. And I will be having discussions with John Healy uh, about this very subject amongst many others to do with my brief. Will we sign it? I don't know. Uh, I'm certainly going to be pressing this for as hard as I possibly can. Because how can we, as others have said and thought and commented, how can we, the United Kingdom, be the foremost promoters of peace on the Security Council of the UN whilst at the same time increasing our nuclear arsenal rather than getting rid of those appalling weapons. So I think that's, um, that's something we, we've, it's as yet undecided, uh, but don't, don't worry, there'll be a lot of us pushing, including I think Lisa Nandy as well, uh, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. That leads me on to Graham's point, which I think is actually a very, very important one, because in my discussions with um, Des Brown, the former Labour Defence Secretary from 2006 to 2008, who's now in the House of Lords. Um, Des Brown uh, is now a huge convert to nuclear disarmament in this country. Uh, and he's uh, part of the European uh, Leadership Network as well. Um, and his view is that actually uh, we, nuclear weapons, they don't guarantee our safety, as we, as we all know. They are not uh, a safeguard against anything. They are the weapons of the 20th century. They are completely outdated. And actually, if we spent a tenth of what we're going to spend on their renewal of, say, Trident, we could have a proper system of cyber defense. Because what he told me, and I have read this elsewhere, is that the Russians are developing cyber warfare in such a sophisticated way that they could render the guidance and uh, launch systems for these uh, shocking and appalling weapons completely useless through hacking and through cyber uh, cyber warfare. Now I don't know how this works because I'm not that, I only did Apple Max, I'm not that expert at these things, um, but if he tells me that he must know what he's talking about, so have others, I've read a few articles on it. So coming back to your point Graham about um, armed drones, we have to address these issues because what's really worrying is not only the armed drones that are currently being used and are unregulated, as you say, but the artificial intelligence that's being programmed into them to make decisions about who gets targeted and therefore killed by the weapons on board these unmanned systems without any danger to the lives of the pilots who are sitting hundreds, if not thousands of miles away in a control center uh, in, in, in warmth, comfort and safety. 
Um, they are a danger to world peace. They do have to be regulated. It's an extremely worrying development. I went to, as, as a shadow defense minister, I went last year to the Farnborough Air Show. Uh, you know, I still have this sort of little boy in me who likes looking at aeroplanes, even if they are used for the most appalling purposes. But what's also uh, useful about this and was useful was to talk to the, the evil BAE systems uh, who developed these, these things and to see their latest development. I think it's called the Typhoon or Tornado. I can't remember their, their, their current aircraft, but they've got some fancy name for it. It's a project still in development. It won't be fully developed for another 20 to 25 years. Thank goodness, it'll probably see me out. But here's the worrying thing. The pilot of one aircraft puts on the helmet, the helmet controls the aircraft and up to a dozen other aircraft in the same squadron that are pilotless. And that one pilot can actually send off these drone aircraft, these are fully fledged aircraft, to do bombing raids, to engage uh, with other aircraft, to shoot down civilian or military aircraft without any risk to any human life because that one pilot controls all those aircraft. Now, it sounds like science fiction fantasy, but believe me, they'll make it become a reality if they have the chance. We've got to stop this, Graham. It's really important. Um, now, do I, Colin, do I agree? Uh, oh, there you are, Colin, yes. Uh, hi. Um, do I agree uh, the case for reducing uh, new, uh, sorry, military expenditure uh, and spending that money on other things? Look, the, I've been arguing for years that we should not be spending money on these nuclear weapons. That's not the question you asked, I accept. Um, but first of all, let's tackle that one. If we could get rid of our nuclear weapons systems overnight, the money we could save could be spent on transport, on saving the planet, on education for our children, on health services, you know, on green, clean transport systems, rather than on military expenditure. But also, if we're going to have a military, let's treat the armed forces personnel with the dignity they deserve for people who are prepared to lay, lay their lives on the line. Now, there are many in this, in this uh, session this afternoon who would not agree with maybe having a military at all. But if you're going to have armed forces and you're asking them to defend your country and keep your people safe, you need to look after their welfare. And at the moment, the way they're treated is shocking and appalling. Their services that help them to survive are privatized, the housing, welfare, uh, mental health services, even the fire stations on our air bases are now run by capita. And that is just a, absolutely terrible. The uh, equipment that they have is often second rate. And why? Because we're spending the money on these vanity uh, projects like uh, the renewal of Trident and the astute class submarines. That is simply not acceptable. Do I agree the case for reducing overall mi military expenditure? Yes. Do I think that if we have armed forces, we should look after them better, which might mean using a fraction of the money we save on nuclear weapons to look after those personnel? That's what I think we should do if we're going to carry on having armed forces. Yes. So in the end, that may work out as a smaller percentage of GDP, but a larger amount of money on the military if you exclude uh, those nuclear weapons. That is my personal view, and it's not party policy, I should say. Party policy is to maintain spending at its current level of 2% of GDP. Uh, conservatives are arguing for 3 or 4 or 5%. I think that would be obscene. <coughs> You're okay to continue? Do like yep. a short break. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, my throat's getting a bit dry. I'm, I'm sure it is. <laughs> And also, a lot of these new messages are very, very complimentary and appreciative of your talk so far. So, Thank you. Uh, you, you have uh, made a big impression. Uh, this one is from Hilary Evans in London. Could you state your question, please? Hilary? Um, yeah, uh, related really to the, uh, a previous question about education, but particularly or specifically about the United Nations. Um, you've mentioned the United Nations a lot, but mm. awareness of the values and benefits of the UN, UN is extremely low amongst the general population. Uh, and yet this is crucially important. The United Nations is crucially important when we're thinking about civilised alternatives to war. Do you have any ideas for how we can better raise awareness and appreciation of the ideals and the importance of the UN and how we can promote uh, the necessary reforms to make it stronger and more effective? And do you think the institution of a public holiday on UN Day would yeah. be a good idea? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Hilary. Yeah. And the next one, could Diana and Nick in Bath please uh, state their question, please? Mm. Sorry. Yes. Um, you spoke about the culture um, being a big player in, in the driving of militarism. And I'd like to ask, would you be in favour of reframing security in human and planetary rather than military terms? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And from our chair in Pudsey, could you oh. state your question? I don't have a question. <laughs> you don't? Oh, no. Jim. Well, I think there's one here about the, the, the resolution of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Ah, yes. That's not my question. That's Nigel's question. Right. Nigel Spate. Yeah. Is Nigel yeah. there? Yeah, Nigel Mark II. Um, <laughs> thank you, Faith. Thank you, Faith, for, for all, all that you've said and the, the passion and commitment you've shown over all these years and uh, the fact that you are still tolerated in the Labour Party and even still <laughs> hold a post in the shadow cabinet is, uh, has Good, isn't it? <laughs> significantly prolonged my membership of the Labour Party. Um, could, could I ask a question as to whether you see any hope or how you would hope that a future Labour government would help to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yeah. Okay, resolve Israel-Palestine. Sorry, I'm just writing, forgive me, um, conflict, right, okay, right, okay, so that's something I've been steeped in for many, many years. Let me just start off with, with Hillary. Um, well, look, Hillary, you're absolutely right. I mean, education is, is vital to changing our our national psyche, our national mood. Uh, we all know how important it is to ensure that we instill the right values into our children through primary, through nursery, and through a secondary education, and then on to higher education uh, through universities and colleges. Um, so the idea of having a greater awareness of the United Nations, it is so important. Uh, forgive me uh, telling you this anecdote, but um, when I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, we used to visit the UN regularly, at least once a year, sometimes twice. And on every occasion we visited that, that fantastic building in New York, uh, we were taken up to see the then General Secretary Kofi Annan. Uh, so much so that when he came to the Houses of Parliament uh, a few years later, well, no, a few months later, um, he actually recognised me on the corridor and knew my name, which I was staggered about because he must meet so many people. But I know he's no longer with us. But one of the things he once said when we asked him, uh, I think it was a question I asked him about Kashmir, he said, Mr Hamilton, in that lovely calm voice he always had, um, sadly, he said, with a hint of irony in his voice, I'm not the president of the world. Um, I'm only the servant of the members of this august body of the United Nations, and I do what they tell me to do. But you know, um, Hillary, it's the nearest thing we've got to world government, whilst it clearly isn't world government. Does it need reform? Yes. My colleague Ray Collins in the House of Lords, um, who's a shadow minister there in the Foreign Office team, is currently looking into uh, Labour's proposals for ref total reform of the UN. It does need reforming. Should there be a public holiday? Absolutely on, on UN Day. We need to remind the British public just how important and how effective the UN's been with all its problems, with all the issues about division within the UN, with the anti-Israel uh, bias that's seen by Israel, with the, all the other problems it has. Who do countries in conflict go to? Where do, where do uh, leaders go to when they've got a problem, a natural disaster, or the uh, after uh, shocks of, of war uh, or earthquakes? They go to the United Nations. And it's, I hope that President Biden, when he takes office, will restore some of the funding that Trump has taken away from the UN. It is too important to starve the UN of the resources it needs, and it's too important to the future of humanity, not to appreciate and educate our children, our young people and the public in general as to why the UN must be sub supported and nurtured and of course reformed. So thank you for that. And that's something I will certainly work on. I've made my submission to Ray Collins uh, in, in many, many forms um, around the treaties that I've talked about, but also about 
more general issues on, on peacekeeping, and I hope that he'll incorporate them into his final report. Diana and Nick in Bath. Um, yes, um, about m militaristic culture. Now, this is interesting. Um, during the last uh, leadership uh, administration, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's administration, I started developing, together with colleagues, uh, an idea called Labour's um, Labour's Peace Doctrine. Now, it sounds a bit sort of pompous, I suppose, uh, and it probably wasn't a very good name. I chose the word doctrine because the military love doctrines, and I thought that they'd quite like this. Um, but one of the things I put to the military, and I never got the chance really to develop this properly, and it's it's been, well, it's been sidelined for the moment, is our armed forces have always been, until now, hugely respected around the world. Somebody put it to, I think it was the Icelandic ambassador put it to me, and you know Iceland doesn't have a military. They said, you know, the, the, the American soldier is trained to be a warrior. The British soldier is trained to save life. And wherever you go in the world, and I've been to a lot of places in the world, people like the fact that the British military always do that what they can to save and preserve life, and that they're totally incorruptible as well as being very well trained. You know, there are other armies that are efficient and they're well organized, but my goodness, they're corrupt. There are other uh, armies that aren't corrupt, but are actually quite disorganized and not well trained. British have all of those. So that respect we have, I thought could be translated into using our armed forces to prevent conflict, to rebuild nations after conflict, to uh, act as peacekeepers, to do all the things that we would like a, a well-organized military force to do. For example, before the pandemic, we had um, we had uh, epidemics in Western Africa, the Ebola, the Ebola crisis. Do you remember that? And with Ebola, which is much more um, infectious uh, than than the than the coronavirus, and much more deadly, of course. Um, sorry, it's less it's less it's less infectious, but much more deadly. Um, you needed a military-style response the civilian authorities could not cope with the cultural constraints on people who fell ill, uh, died or were dying. The military needed to do that and then eventually hand over back to the civilian authority. That's an area where we could change the culture of militarism, which is about killing people basically, let's be, let's be clear about it, to being an organized top-down uh, force, you know, uh, uh, like a pyramid, where orders are given and, and carried out that actually benefits humanity, the oppressed, the poor, the victims, the people who've suffered from natural disasters, or usually man-made disasters, which are wars and conflicts. So I think we could be a kind of, not world police force, because we'd have to do it through the United Nations, but we could retask our military from fighting wars for our own self-importance or self-interest to going back to some of the countries that we've, if you like, we've exploited, I put it kindly, over centuries and, and saying, right, we will now act as honest brokers. I mean, I suppose Sierra Leone came nearest to that with all the sand line business in the early, the late nineties under I mean, Blair's first administration. Actually, we did rather well there, even though the UN weren't too happy about it, but I'm not suggesting we do things unilaterally. I'm suggesting we retask our military as a force for good, a force for peace, a force for saving life. So that's something I've done quite a bit of work on. That's currently been sidelined, I'm afraid. Um, uh, Israel-Palestine, thank you, uh, Nigel, um, for asking that. Well, where can we start? I have spent probably the best part of my 23 years in Parliament uh, being involved with Israel-Palestine. It's very close to my heart. I am Jewish myself. I have family in Israel. I am really angry and upset by the way that the Israeli government and armed forces treat the Palestinians. I've been to Palestinian camps. I've been to the occupied territories many, many times. I've probably visited the region 15, 18 times in the last 23 years. I know people there on both sides. I'm horrified by the way Palestinians are treated. Um, until the Israeli government decides or agrees or realizes, as Yitzhak Rabin did and paid for with his life, that you have to treat the Palestinian people as if they were human beings and your equals and accord them the respect that all human beings deserve and therefore help them to set up a nation state. 
that would live <coughs> side by side in peace <coughs> excuse me, with Israel, then you're not going to get anywhere with a, a, a permanent peace agreement. The power relationship at the moment is, is really appalling. But I've had some incredibly uplifting meetings in spite of the horror and the oppression uh, and the weakness of the Palestinian people uh, with both Palestinians and Israelis. There's some amazing, because Israel is, is a, an open democracy, there are some amazing NGOs in Israel run by Jewish and Arab Israelis that work very hard to bring the two sides together culturally, physically, in terms of language, in terms of faith. Uh, and I've traveled all over Israel and all over the occupied territories. And I've met inspirational people who have peace at their very core and their very heart. They should be the ones that should be able to come forward. But unfortunately, we get the Netanyahu's, we get the moneyed interests, we get the, 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 men, the men of violence uh, on both sides. Uh, and that stops um, the peace from actually coming through. It is the extremes on, on both the Palestinian and the Israeli side that seem to dominate the agenda rather than the vast majority that actually want to find a peaceful way through to a genuine two-state solution. And I just say this, the window is closing fast on the possibility of a two-state solution. The West Bank is being split in two by Israel's settler policy. And I think the world should be much stricter uh, with, with the Israelis and say to them, you, if you want, genuinely want a peace in this region and don't want to live in a state of permanent war, you have to stop dividing the Palestinians and allowing those areas to be illegally settled in. That is just not acceptable. I've been to those settler areas and I've seen the places outside Hebron, for example. And it is absolutely, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm Jewish and I see to my horror what the Jewish state is doing, not in the name of all Jews, but in the name of its own government, what it's doing to other human beings. And I witnessed an argument on my last visit there a couple of years ago between a guy, a, a Jewish Israeli, who was showing us the work they were doing in Hebron for the Palestinian people and a group of settlers, and I don't speak Hebrew or Ivrit, who were abusing this guy in a horrible, you could see the violence in their body language. And we've got to get past that in some way, because if the peoples in that area are ever going to live together in peace, it's culture as well as everything else that's going to, that's going to make the difference and allow that to happen. You know, it was a tragedy that Rabin was murdered when he was uh, by an Israeli Jew. And if, I, if anybody ever goes to Tel Aviv, go and see the Israel Museum, which is also the Rabin Museum run by Dalia Rabin, uh, his daughter. It's absolutely inspirational. And it's that set of values that I hope will prevail. I'm not hopeful at the moment, but, you know, the USA can make a difference here. They have an important say. And I hope the Biden administration will take this up immediately because nothing in my view is more important in that region than establishing a permanent peace and a two state solution while it's still possible. So I could talk for a lot longer about it, but I hope that's answered some of your questions. It can be resolved, but it has to have goodwill and international pressure, Nigel. Thank you so much for passing on that inspirational idea there. And, um, are you ready for a, a, yep. a, a break? Or? No, 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 carry on. I'll, I'll try and be briefer. I'm sorry about my long answers. Not nice at all. There's, there's now 63 new messages, so we won't get <laughs> through them, but I'll try and choose the ones. Okay. Uh, Paul McGowan could, of Coventry, could you give your question, please? Could you unmute? Yes, thank you. Um, this is prompted by what you said about the uh, refusal to complete the the ratification of the, the, uh, the protocols under UNCCW. Um, the UK has had on the statute books since 2010, a law prohibiting any form of support to the production and uh, sale of cluster munitions. Yet it is a fact that pension funds, and I'm referring here to our own West Midlands Pension Fund, um, continue to invest in companies which are known to be producers of cluster munitions. Um, and they, they wriggle and they contort themselves into all kinds of stupid positions. Uh, 
on the grounds that this part of the company that they're investing in doesn't make cluster bonds and so on. Um, surely this could simply be stopped if uh, the government had a will to do it. And, and it's entirely in our hands to do it uh, as a country. And yeah. uh, I just don't understand how we can continue to allow this kind of thing to go on. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Paul. I don't have your question, but your Sumaya Siddika, uh, Siddika, I hope I got that right. Could you ask your question, please? Uh, from John Hill, John Hills from Canterbury. Could you, could you um, give your question, please? Sorry, I'm not sure I really had a question. I, I, I've just okay. enjoyed listening to Fabian and agreeing with so much. It's so refreshing and uplifting and enlightening. And my God, we need that. So thank you, Fabian. Thank you. Uh, Can I ask something? Ro Can Rose. I just... Sorry. Yeah. Can I say something? Could you say your name, please? Rini, I really do. Um, I just want to say all of us are either bald or white-haired. Isn't that a shame? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's a rose from Rickmansworth. Could you state your, I'm using the state your question. Yes. I want, I want to know if, if as an MP you're receiving messages from people you wouldn't normally hear from about um, their objection to the arms trade. Because I found it's becoming more common for people to be very in, indignant about arms being sold to Saudi Arabia, for instance. Yeah. yeah. And maybe that's what we as individuals can exploit in our communications in our localities. Yep. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I have Sumaya's text now, so perhaps all right. not there, I could just read it myself. Yep. Yeah. Um, I am currently a member of the Peace Society and in the running for an executive role at the University of Bradford. What yeah. can I do to implement change and raise awareness for the movement for the abolition of war and humanity, presumably? Peace studies, right, okay. I mean, I'd say to... Is Sumaya on the call still or she left? I'm still here. She's... Oh, good, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps disconnecting. I don't know why. I'm really sorry about that. Oh, hi, Samaya. Hi. Oh, good. Please have it. State um, your question. Hiya. <laughs> I feel like the, I'm like the only person here who's not. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm the only student here. Is there any other students here? Well, you're not bald and white haired. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, there are some other students okay, here. Okay, good. There good. are. Um, I was. So. I'm currently on the peace studies degree doing international relations, politics and security studies. And there's only about 10 of us. There's like no one else on the course. And so we've created a peace society and there's up to about 85 members, but we don't have anything to, I guess, raise awareness for and we don't know how to go about it. So I was wondering like what we could do exactly to have that type of voice or power. Um. Can I suggest, sorry, Sumaya, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you off here, but can I suggest that perhaps given that you're about five miles away from where I am now, not that we meet personally, but perhaps I'd be very happy to do a, uh, an online call with you personally or with your, your group and maybe throw some ideas out to help you. Because for me, sort of Bradford's got the only peace studies department in the country, uh, although I think it needs Beckett's got a uh, peace studies professor. Um, and there's the, the the war studies department at King's College London um, but you know yours is the most famous that's why Paul Rogers is taking over from Bruce shortly uh, the former professor there and a good friend um, can I can I if I if I can get my contact details through to you uh, then could should we set up a separate call that might be more helpful than, than doing it because I've been I'm very anxious to help you okay, okay. I will take it down now all right, so drop me a line at, at Fabian, and this is for anybody else that's on the call that wants to get in touch. F-A-B-I-A-N, my first name, at leedsne.co.uk. Mm -hmm. Leedsne is one word. And just drop me a line. I'll remember your name, but remind me that we met on this, uh, and then we can set up something separate, if, if, if that's okay. Um, 
Uh, Rose, can I just come back to Ro Rose from Rickmansworth? Um, there you are, I can see you. Is that, sorry, Samaya, is that okay? Uh, I'm sorry I haven't answered your question directly. Um, Rose, uh, yes, I, I do get a lot of messages about Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, a lot compared with, not a lot compared with, say, on about coronavirus, but uh, quite a lot about the arms trade. Um, and you're right, I think we need a kind of mass movement on this. I think we need much more anger from constituents mm. uh, expressed to their MPs. As I said earlier on in the talk, MPs are actually quite susceptible to their constituents' views. And even if they don't agree with them, they will listen to them because that's what we're there for. And you're the people that elect us. So I would say if we are angry, as I am intensely angry, I've done so many urgent questions and statements in the house on uh, arms sales, especially to Saudi Arabia. Uh, my, my, my former colleague, who's former Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornberry, it was the one big thing she was obsessed about because it, was, it made her so angry. The Supreme mm. Court told the British government that they should no longer export arms to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And then Liz Truss, the International Trade Secretary, stood in front of the House less than a year ago and mm. said, oh, I have to apologize because we accidentally sold a load of arms to Saudi Arabia and broke the law. You know, do we, does this country run under the rule of law or not? Because the British yeah, government quite. cannot break the rule of law. And if the court says you can't do this, you can't do it. She should have resigned. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I think we need to be much more angry about this. Um, a woman I know who's a journalist, uh, who's not far from here in, in, in Selby, North Yorkshire, she made an excellent Channel 4 dispatches about the effect of British munitions and know-how sold to Saudi Arabia on the war in Yemen. And I had a very good briefing from the Yemen desk uh, in the Foreign Office just before the uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown, which actually gave me an extraordinary amount of information, which is unusual for the British government to allow opposition MPs or shadow ministers to come into the FCO and, and get that personal briefing. But, but they did. And, uh, I, you know, I feel I know much more now, thanks to Sue's documentary and Channel 4 Dispatches, you can, you can check it out about a year ago. Um, we've got to do a lot more. We've got to have much louder voices, make much mm. more fuss about this, get the British public really angry. Because the idea that our workers are producing these weapons, which our government, through its lack of any political will, is just allowing to be sold to one of the worst countries to abuse uh, those arms sales, Saudi Arabia, is it's anathema to me and I hope to every other British person. Um, Paul uh, from Coventry. Now, you, you very rightly talked about cluster munitions uh, being illegal. Um, they are illegal. Um, pension funds should not be uh, investing in companies that have any connection to the manufacture of these weapons and they should be stopped. But the issue here is political will because the problem that I found, and I'm not saying that the last Labour government was entirely innocent either of this, is the way that government's uh, hands are forced by big business, not forced, but the persuasion, the kind of pally way that these companies uh, befriend individual government ministers or civil servants, or let's face it, the pervasive and uh, really bad influence of some of the public affairs companies on MPs who are in and around government is quite, quite shocking, actually. I think we need more regulation about outside interference in the policies and mechanics of government. But of course, that's not going to happen anytime soon because Dominic Cummings, the real prime minister, is gradually dismantling the mechanisms of government in this country. And by the way, you heard it here first. Don't be surprised if the Conservatives win the next general election, if they do win it, and then propose that the prime minister of the country be directly elected, because I think that's the next step that they're planning. We have an unwritten constitution, which is being torn apart by the fact that these people who are currently running the country, and I'm sorry if anybody in this room is a conservative, but they have absolutely, you know, they're abusing the trust that politicians agree to when they become part of the system of governance of this country because there is no written constitution. You do it on the basis of trust. That trust is being destroyed, all the mechanics are being dismantled and frankly there won't be much left of the way we run our government and that will be vastly open to corruption as it is already 
when we've seen some of the money that's been spent on PP and other supplies during this pandemic. Uh, so, sorry, that's slightly off the subject, Paul, but the fact is, uh, you know, pension funds do, people who invest in pension funds should have a voice, especially if they get together and form uh, bigger groups. Um, and they should say to their pension funds, we will not, we will not, um, we will stop you from investing in companies that produce weapons like this. They are illegal, they should be stopped. The political will isn't there to do it, so we've got to use much more democratic ways of doing it. It's not a great answer, I'm afraid, but it's the only one I can, I can think of. Now, finally, uh, Rini, you said, uh, why are so many people bald? Yes, I've lost my hair. White-haired, I've got a white beard, so I fall into that category. Sorry, uh, you, 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 you don't, Rose, but uh, uh, a lot of us do. Um, uh, and obviously, Samaya doesn't either. Um, but look, it, it is a worry. Um, peace is for the young. I mean, we are moving towards, many of us moving towards the end of our lives, and we want to see a better planet and a better society for our children, for our grandchildren, if we're lucky enough to have them, but for the young. The, the planet is theirs to inherit. They are the next generation. We want to make it as good as possible for them. Um, and I'm just saddened that we haven't got more of those people um, on this call and in our organizations to stop war, to stop nuclear weapons, to make the world a more peaceful place. One of the things I learned on the International Development Committee, and I'm sorry to my fellow men uh, for saying this, is that the more women that are involved in peace, and the more women that are involved in stopping conflict, the more likely it is to succeed. Mm. Um, we need to have a much greater equality worldwide of men and women in all the institutions and organizations and community uh, uh, groups that we that we have because that that equality makes all the difference and giving equal value to women you know we, we accept it in this country although we don't practice it wholly i'm glad to say the british labor party now has more women mps than men but that's the first time ever but that's a step but it isn't far enough if we can achieve that perfect equality um, that is more likely to bring us peace. I'm not just saying that to suck up to you, Rose, but it's absolutely true. And the empirical evidence is there. We did a huge amount of work in Ethiopia just as I joined the committee. I sadly didn't go to Addis or to any of the villages nearby where my colleagues went. But what they found was by stopping some of the horrible practices of FGM, we won't talk about that on this call, um, by actually educating the women and the men in the villages about the importance not necessarily the people doing the same jobs but given equality of status to all the work that's carried out to make life bearable and civilized those villages were more peaceful more prosperous did better and the health mental and physical health was better too so you know it's about education but it's about valuing each and every one of us too and i think in the end that's what peace is about it's about the value we put to every human being on this planet that we all have a right to a decent civilized life and enjoying the things that we are privileged to enjoy in this country but that most of the planet sadly still doesn't um we've got a long way to go but we can do it but let's get our young involved let's get our women and our girls involved too uh, because then we can really make a difference thank you so much for inviting me today very good thank you. enjoy it very much in and uh, I hope if you're enthused to, uh, anybody is enthused to join more, you will pop along and visit our website. Yeah. Oh, 